Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our tribal project session this afternoon. Um, we'll be utilizing the chat box for any questions or comments that you have for the panelists. Um, also, if you're calling in, um, you can email me for any questions or any of the presenters. Um, my email address is Karen dash die at Cherokee.org. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Our first uh, presenter is Kirsten with Iowa Tribe of Oklahoma. Um, Kirsten, you have the floor. Of Oklahoma, kind of smack dab in the middle between Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Um, and this is Getting Our Hands Dirty, a Wetland Education Center rebuild. So let's get started. So a little background on the original goals and objectives. Back in about 1998, 2000, uh, Arlene Godoy, who was an Iowa Tribe employee, uh, set a goal of increasing environmental education and awareness of wetland functions and cultural uses. And this, the black and white photo there, that's actually the Iowa tribe complex. Uh, and within the red rectangle there is where the area of question is. So uh, the original objectives were to develop a community-based nature center or wetland habitat center and to provide educational materials to local schools and community groups. Um, the drawings there are actually some of Ms. Godoy's original sketches for the area, um, and we actually used those on the project as reference, which became quite handy. Um, there's the initial construction where they dug the pond, and you'll see how that progressed shortly. So this was the final product. Um, you see here they've got a little bit of an irrigation system and trails running around the, this pond, uh, quite a bit of rock and a platform for viewing. Um, at the time they did outreach and someone would get in the pond with waders on and they would and uh, show the youth crawdad and fish and things of that nature. Um, and it was really a successful uh, project overall. She had a variety of wetlands including the pond itself and then this next area which kind of looks like a, a bog or a peat bog and then where oops uh, back in the in the background here where the taller stuff is was more of a marsh and then she her effort was to show how these different wetlands function with regard to absorbing water and filtering the water and providing different habitats and things And so the project went on and like I said, it was a great success for many years and got a lot of great use out of it. Um, had a lot of involvement. Frequently people would go out, I would try members would go out and help plant or help weed. And there was just a lot of community involvement. And of course, over time, as things often do, especially a period of 20 some odd years, things kind of fell into disrepair and became a little dilapidated. Um, as you can see here, the these black boxes on the sides, those are actually pumps where the water used to come in and filter down over sort of makeshift waterfalls. Um, those, after 20 years or so, they were broken or missing or had worn out, you name it. Um, the pond liner itself was pretty shot, had a lot of leaks in it, had a lot of, of things growing up through it, um, and the pond would not hold more than six or eight inches of water here. Um, not a lot of room for fish to grow. As you can see, the, the patio observation deck there is pretty dilapidated, pretty aged, and generally not well taken care of. The trail has even grown up quite a bit. Here's another angle of it. Here, the whole area it, uh, sort of, like I said, fell into disrepair. Uh, of course, that happens with 
with staff changes and things. You also had a lot of overgrowth, uh, both up through the observation deck and in general around. You've also got tripping hazards here in the bottom and things. So overall, not a good place to want to send your elder or your youth if you want to have them out and looking around at this area. So what sparked the rebuild and the revamp? So our then, in 2018 or so, our then director, Yvette Wiley, attended a conference with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, also hosted by the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, <clears throat> Climate Science NIACS, up around the Great Lakes. Um, and there, she was introduced to this concept of a tribal climate adaptation menu, which is pictured here in, in the, the background. Um, and this kind of spurred the idea of revamping the Wetland Education Center and also tying in pollinator habitat, which as we all know, pollinators are sort of in dire straits right now. So Yvette set out with the goal of revamping this, and in doing so, she came up with a game plan and that consisted of these three strategies consult cultural leaders key community members and elders learn through careful and respectful observation and support tribal engagement in the environment and that was well and all and things were going smooth until COVID entered the case in which case we abruptly transitioned from that game plan to the second part of the game plan which was just to get the project done as soon as possible with pending shutdowns prolonged shutdowns and all that sort of mess that came with covid the so having transitioned from the initial game plan to getting the project done as soon as possible um we did track some, some strong successes and some continued efforts, and they are what follow. So on the left is the initial um, pond shortly before we started, of course, 20 years after it had been begun. Um, it, it actually looks fairly decent in this photo, but we called in some assistance from the Iowa Tribe Maintenance Department and they abruptly cleared everything out within a day or so um, and kind of gave us a fresh canvas to start with. Within another few days or so, the new liner had been put in, the rocks had been replaced around the liner, the new pumps installed, um, had begun filling the pond, and then this gazebo had been brought in from another location. And you can see here this gentleman is is plumbing in or maybe doing electrical work, um, getting ready to run power to the pump. Nothing's been planted at this point. None of the trails have been redone. It's really just still in the beginning phases apart from the pond itself. Incidentally, with the pond regaining water, we almost immediately had crawdads and turtles come back into the picture. Uh, I would say probably within a week or two, even though it was in the dead of winter, we had a hundred or so crawdad and two or three turtles taking up shelter in this pond. A few months later, this is the result. We have a completed trail. We have additional rock brought in. We've got this gazebo that's now been uh, refurbished and stained. We've got tons of mulch, literal tons of mulch, um, and we've got lots of greenery. Let me catch up with myself here. Uh, this is another angle looking back. Uh, this marshy area here in the front um is basically remained the same from when Miss Godoy first planted it 
Uh, the only addition we made was uh, locally sourcing some cattails and horsetail to bring in, and hopefully those will not necessarily take over, but will uh, multiply and create additional habitat and go from there. Uh, these posts here, as you'll see, those are actually for signage, which we had quite a time coming up with what we were going to do as far as signage, and I'll show you why here shortly. But also, the trail, if anyone's wondering, is not typical gravel. Uh, we figured gravel would shift too much, and we have a, a daycare here at the Iowa Tribe. We needed something that would handle strollers fairly easily. So this is actually limestone screenings, which um, allows water to flow through. It doesn't really hold water very well. And as it gets compacted, it ends up turning almost like concrete. It gets very, very hard. Takes a while to get that way, but it does. As you can see, we've got tons of mulch. I think all in all, we had um, about 30 or 40 yards of mulch brought in. Um, we had uh, the plants, um, the Uchi Butterfly Farm in Bixby, Oklahoma, provided upwards of 1,000, 1,200 plants or so, about 17 different species, um, <clears throat> including ironweed, buttonbush, uh, sawtooth sunflower, goldenrod, purple coneflower, blue mountain mist, monarda, uh, several varieties of milkweed, and rattlesnake master, just to name a few. Um, and some of the folks there from the butterfly farm came out and helped us plant, spent a few days with us to, to help plant. And luckily the weather uh, was cooperative. So uh, this is an early finished picture, uh, not quite finished at this point. You can still see the pumps. Since then, we've taken additional rock and, and built it up to hide those a little better. And we've also got signage. Um, as we got to this point, some of the native plants had started to reestablish, like the sort of brown tinge things here. That's actually dock coming off of a parking lot. It's a plant called dock, and it provides um, food for some of the local birds. Many of the things we used were locally sourced. Um, the lily pads in the pond, we locally sourced those from a pond across the street from the complex. Uh, the logs in the pond, we were able to pull those um, from some of the creeks that had some log jams. Uh, we also locally sourced horsetail and cattails and fish, uh, just mostly just fish fry, little tiny fish. Um, but we Gosh, we probably ended up with 200 or so of those. And even now, a year later, we have little schools of fish floating around. Um, we did, the one thing we put in that was not necessarily a natural look was koi fish. And that was at the request of some tribal members. They were having trouble seeing the fish fry when the water got murky. So we put koi in there to kind of give them um, more of a visual sense of, of life in the pond. Um, all the fish are still doing well. In fact, the koi have had, um, have given birth. So we actually have more than that now. Um, and that's another measure of, of the success that the pond is functioning as it should and that, that the project overall was successful. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that Yvette had wanted to tie in pollinators and pollinator habitat. And um, what better way to tell that that's successful than to see actual pollinators? Um, all of these images came from the, around the pond. Um, you've got a hummingbird moth there in the upper left-hand corner, and of course a monarch down the lower right-hand corner. Um, eventually, we'd like to see this sort of turned into a, or at least 
included as a monarch way station, uh, if that's the right word for it. Um, and you can see on the purple cone, purple cone flower here, a bee and some other pollinators on the golden rod here. So overall, there's a lot of life around this pond and a lot of uh, a lot of buzz, which is nice. I mentioned earlier that we've seen a lot of wildlife um, as far as crawdads and turtles and things. We set up a wildlife cam just to kind of get a feel for what was actually using the pond. And we, of course, we've got squirrels and crows and things, typical things you might find in your yard. But we've also got a lot of nightlife. We've got raccoons. We've got a family of deer that come up. And bear in mind, this isn't a fenced in area of the complex. Somehow the deer make their way in. We've also got owls and snakes and just a, a whole variety. I've not seen coyotes yet. But that's not to say they don't come up and get a drink. So signage. I'd mentioned signage was kind of something that took a while to develop. Part of the reason for that is this is what we had started with. Not that there's anything wrong with this. It's a little wordy though. Um, and we we kind of had a variety of people that we were trying to appeal to. We had elders, we had the youth and the daycare. And so we we kind of postponed putting signage up until we saw who used the trail the most and who used the pond the most. And um, of course, with COVID, it's kind of difficult to tell. But at, for now, anyway, the daycare has been the primary user of the, the trails. Um, so we, we kind of geared our signage towards a younger crowd. Um, and they include these things listed here on the left, the welcome, the among the reeds, benefits of the wetlands, nightlife, et cetera. And when I say things like, um, senses that particular sign is just a um a reminder to look around and to listen to what you hear and to to kind of take the opportunity to feel the different textures and uh to smell things and just kind of be an eye opener to other aspects of being outside uh especially nowadays that since we're all kind of stuck behind a screen it's it works well to uh, remind the youngsters what they are missing out when they're not behind a screen. Nightlife, uh, that, that one was kind of a, a toss up, but it, it works well to remind us that there is a whole other side of things when we're not around during the day um, or on the weekend or what have you. Um, with the owls and crickets and toads and things. And it it draws attention to those things and how there's a whole flip side of the animal community that takes use of this pond and these wetlands just as the sun goes down. And here are some examples of those signs. Uh, not very good pictures per se, but it gives you an example. And, if you're curious what the materials are, it, that's just plexiglass and the paper that the signs are printed on has been laminated. So they're basically waterproof and then they're wedged between two pieces of plexiglass and then around the edge they've been siliconed. So they're not sharp and they're still sealed from the outside from from moisture and such. And we just affix those to the post and we we didn't want to overdo it with signage. Uh, it's fairly small area, maybe a quarter acre or so if that i think we have about seven or eight signs spread out around so some some issues that we encountered and some things to consider if your group is looking to do something of this nature uh flooding is one thing in particular we had a pretty wet winter um, and one thing we did not account for was runoff from certain areas of the parking lot taking and and flooding. You can see here it, it 
it wouldn't be a problem here were it not for this border. It would run straight into the grasses and absorb. This image here is a little further down. It actually overtakes the trail. And you'll see on the next image, on the next slide, it actually begins to wash this out, which at that point, that trail is unusable because of the tripping hazard. We don't need elders getting out there and tripping or anything. So uh, this is actually something that we've got to look at either installing some drainage underneath or tearing this part of the trail out completely and just rethinking it. So definitely keep in mind flooding issues if you're looking at installing a trail. Um, an issue that we had ran into shortly after we filled the pond was the liner was cut too small for the hole. And so water was seeping as water would fill the pond, especially after rain, water would get down behind the the liner and start to bubble up. And you can see the the in the shallow areas here, the pond is not actually that shallow, but the bubbles uh, have formed. So we've gone in since and rather than poking holes, which would cause it to drain, of course, we just took additional rock and threw it in there or just strategically placed it to keep the bubbles down. It's been about a year since that's happened and it's done great so far. Plus it provides a little bit more hiding area for fish that are in the pond. So no complaints there. Um, like I said, the dock and other native plants that had been in place before, if you're gonna put down mulch, mulch can be pretty expensive and get pretty expensive pretty quickly. So really consider whether it's necessary or, or what areas it's even necessary in. Because some plants like the dock here, they're gonna come back regardless of whether you have mulch or not. So it may not be worth your money or your time. Um, I had mentioned the pond filling up and having water run under it. An, another issue that we had was the pond overflowing onto the trail. So uh, we ended up going back and digging down a, a low area, uh, an already low area, digging it down even further and installing an additional liner to make sort of a, a spillway if you will from the pond that runs over here slows the water down and then this actually flows into um, what was considered a bog or marshy area and that sort of replenishes things um, now some some um, future endeavors that we'd like to look at now um, hopefully that that COVID is slowing down are um, some more community involvement, getting tribal members out to to plant or to um, to identify, maybe do a um, like a bio blitz where you go and you find as many different critters and things of different species and such, and you you try and get a greater number each year that you do it. Um, if that makes sense. So you get a tally one year and then you try and trump that the next year and so on and so forth. And so as you do that, you you get an idea of what you have in the area. You also kind of spur some interest in in the area and in the the um, organisms. And so people can go on and research or they can reach out to us and we can tell them a little bit more about us. And pollinators especially is where that idea sort of stems from because we want to really expand on um, pushing knowledge of, of pollinators and how important they are. Um, additionally, with the gazebo now, folks can come in and eat their lunch on their lunch hour. We'd like to see like uh, maybe a story time type situation where we have elders uh, tell stories or read to the youth or what have you. Um, there's there's a lot of opportunity out there it just with COVID, it kind of has shut things down um as far as any involvement beyond what there already is so with that um i'd like to make a few acknowledgements of course arlene godoy uh, for her initial leadership on the project years ago and for 
um, taking great notes and and being a an excellent resource for us to refer to. Um, I, I did not include Yvette on here, but I'd like to go ahead and mention her um, for her leadership on the project early on. Uh, the Iowa Business Committee, of course, for supporting us, the U.S. and Fish and Wildlife Services for funding us, the Uchi Butterfly Farm in Bixby for both supporting and donating all those plants, um, the Iowa Maintenance Department for tearing out the old pond and plumbing in the new, and then the Pond Pro Shop in Shawnee, uh, which may come across a little odd being that they're retail, uh, but they were a great resource for information on pumps and um, sort of the nitty gritty of what we would need in terms of um, plumbing and pumps and liners and such. So that is all I have. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions, the best way to get a hold of me is my email there at the bottom. Um, if you have any questions or if you'd like to see more pictures or or whatever, just reach out and I'd be happy to chat with you. So that's all I have and I'll take any questions you have now. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box just yet. Oh, wait, we just now got one. Hold on, let me see if I can scroll up and read it. Two questions, which department of the Iowa tribe took responsibility over the project is the first question. Okay, that would be the Office of Environmental Services. Um, one thing I didn't mention, we have developed a maintenance plan. It will not go to the maintenance department. It'll just be sort of an in-house OES thing that handles um, like weed pulling and weed eating and making sure that the, the fish are healthy and that there's enough water in the pond and such. So it'll, it'll remain within the OES department. Okay, thank you. And the second question, where did the funding come from? You know, I don't think I mentioned that. <laughs> I'm glad someone asked. Uh, that was a US Fish and Wildlife um, grant's not the right word for it, I don't think. It's more of a, um, oh gosh, not stipend. I don't know the word for it right offhand. I'm sorry. It's not a grant. It's um, like we put the money up front and they pay us back. Re reimbursement. There you go. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions just yet. Um, if you want to stop sharing, Kristen, and check your chat box, you may have a question or a comment. And I will check my emails real quick. Um, like I was saying, if, if you're calling in, um, you can shoot me an email if you have a question or even after the fact. Uh, my email address is karen die at cherokee.org. Let me check my email real quick. And I do not have any in my chat box, so we're good there. Okay, I didn't see any of my emails just yet, but we can check again later. Thank you, Kirsten. We appreciate it. Uh, we'll move on. Our next presenter is Debbie with the Eastern Shawnee Tribe. Let me make you a presenter, Debbie, and that way you can share your screen. Okay, you should be able to share your screen now, Debbie. No. I can see your screen now. You go to. Is that good? good. Yep. Okay. All right. It looks odd on my side, so it's kind of I don't know. <laughs> uh, and I think if we're ready. Yes, ma'am. You have the floor. Okay. Well, my name is Debbie Dotson, and I work for the Eastern Shawnee Tribe. I've been here about eleven years in the environmental department. And we have we have a pretty diverse workload around here. Um, I personally do water quality and non-point source 
most of the time, but sometimes I get involved in other activities as well. And um, I was going to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of our experiences through 2020. We had to do a little bit of uh, thinking outside the box and uh, looking for alternative ways to do things. And uh, we had a pretty good year, even though it was it had some really rough spots, but uh, I'd like to just show you a little bit of what what we experienced and maybe that would help somebody else in in the future as we still have uh, things are changing, but uh, you know you may may run into another issue in the future where maybe you could use some of our ideas. Uh, a little bit of uh, info about our department. So in 2020, you know, we these are our basic grant programs. Our PPG from EPA includes our GAP and water quality and non-point source grants. A big part of our GAP program is our Four Feathers Recycle Center. And we've been in business up there about 10 years. And uh, we run local routes, picking up cardboard and paper from uh, businesses in the community that surrounds us. So it's not, and also for the tribe. So tribal businesses and tribal offices. And we've been doing that for quite a while too. Um, we manage the tribe's drinking water and wastewater systems. So that water tower there in the picture, you know, whether you're coming, you know, from east or west, headed towards my office, you can see that water tower from quite a ways away. We have another drinking water system at the, our main casino too, that uh, down close to Seneca, Missouri, but uh, we manage that one as well. And uh, we handle all the trust services and land management for the department or for the tribe. So, you know, any of our properties that are in trust, um, so, you know, it's up to our office to get that paperwork together and, and stay on top of all the forms or reporting that goes with that. We also do public health and safety, uh, do inspections, and we offer classes occasionally. We haven't done so much of that for the last year, but uh, in the past we've done food safety and uh, general safety, ATB training, different things that um, the tribe needs for their employees. We also uh, get to be the landlords for the tribe's uh, rental properties, including our elders units. We have 16 uh, elders duplex units that uh, fall under that. And we also have um, some greenhouses, hoop houses, where uh, we've got We've got plants in the ground this year. We're off to a much better start. But back in 20, early 2020, we were making plans for a lot of great things, but it just really didn't work out very well for us. So uh, we declared a state of emergency in March uh, 2020, and 85% of our administration employees were placed on furlough. And there was no, nobody really knew how long that would be or and then some of the employees that weren't on furlough were able to work from home. Uh, so that it was pretty quiet around here for a while because we had our buildings locked down where, you know, the public couldn't come in and out. Unless you worked in our building, you couldn't come in our building. And it's still that way. We have a, a public phone up front and a drop box. And, you know, because our county offices are in the, in the same building where I am. But um, any of our buildings, you know, we had to block access and we require masks still in the buildings. If I leave my office to go to the restroom across the hall, I put my mask on. So well, we're still doing it. But we, we made it through uh, with four employees from the environmental department that were able to stay on and not be furloughed. Um, I'm sure a lot of that had to do with the drinking water, wastewater, uh, things like that, that that were, you know, necessary for sure. And also, you know, my job is totally grant funded. So um, and I don't have, a, you know, water quality is hard, kind of hard to do from home. So I, I was able to stay as well. So, and in addition to our regular duties, which are already pretty varied, <laughs> Um, we we absorbed a few new ones as needed, you know, if, if there wasn't an office that was filled or, you know, some sort of job that 
you know, that person wasn't able to be there, you know, we, we kind of filled in as we could. And a lot of times we had to had to make changes in what we thought we were going to do because we had material shortages, uh, a lot of closures nationwide. So a lot of our supplies to order and things like that definitely put a, a wrench in our in a, any of our plans. Recycling uh, got hit pretty hard with the pandemic with uh, we had about suspend all of our recycling operations because you know when they first started talking about COVID-19 they weren't really sure if it traveled on you know your packages and people were washing their bags from the grocery store and they weren't sure if it traveled on surfaces and so uh, we did not collect cardboard or paper or anything uh, for a while and then uh, June 1st of 2020, some of our employees got to come back and we started doing cardboard and paper recycling again. We still weren't doing car uh, plastic or cans. A lot of those are pop cans, water bottles, things where people have eaten, eaten or drink, drank out of the container, so we weren't going to collect those, but uh, we did start doing some of our recycling. And in our office collection, uh, we're still doing curbside pickup. So on Tuesdays every week, uh, the office complex, if they have cardboard for us to pick up, they've, they've been nice enough to put it out on the curb for us. So they're, we're not going in and out of buildings. Water quality, non-point source, I'd say we fared pretty well considering uh, what we had to deal with and uh, we did get all of our surface water sampling complete. Most of my problems with that weren't due to COVID, but due to flooding. I had four different sampling events that I had to make up uh, because we were flooded out when we were supposed to go. And then I had to do it, you know, sometimes I'd have to go twice in one month instead of, you know, instead of once, or uh, just kind of double up on the workload a little bit. But uh, we were able to get through it and we did have a rain garden project last year, which it was a really bad year to try to do a rain garden. First of all, we weren't really sure, you know, would somebody be there to, to you know, implement it or to grow plants or do anything like that. So uh, we kind of put it off a little bit to see kind of how things played out. And then uh, about mid June, they let me. Um, hire my intern. I usually get an intern a little earlier in the year, but uh, after he started and we decided we just have to buy plants and and put them in, I, I wouldn't recommend starting a rain garden in mid-June or July, but uh, it takes a lot of extra, extra maintenance, but uh, we were able to get it complete and it's still doing pretty well. A lot of those uh, small plants in that picture there actually got pretty big but you know by fall and some of them still bloomed in the fall so that was kind of a nice a nice addition next to our police department outreach projects those were that was a pretty dismal forecast in 2020 and that's usually one of my favorite things in the spring is environmental fairs and uh, different things with student projects and we didn't have any schools open with nobody was available and uh, so our calendar was just blank and that was that was really kind of strange it seemed like that that's usually my busiest time with you know I'm trying to figure out how to juggle the different things that I need to do and then all of a sudden it's like well oh, there's nothing there okay but we did um, come up with some ideas. Um, the only people coming onto our campus were the older folks that come and get their meals at the AOA every day. Uh, they did drive through curbside pickup for their food every day. So for Earth Day, we decided, well, those are the only people we have to outreach to, but uh, we sent them home with small, uh, some, uh, milkweed planters and 
uh, some different brochures, some puzzles, uh, even some colored pencils and some of the grown up coloring pages and some Earth Day information. And, uh, and we sent that home with them with their lunch that day as they drove through. They also got an Earth Day bag. And then the AOA started hosting, uh, they called it Car Bingo. And it was actually pretty popular, you know, because when you when you've got absolutely nothing to do for a while, all of a sudden it's, you know, it sounds pretty exciting. There's something to do. So uh, they had to stay in their car. The participants had to stay in their car, and they parked with a space between each car, so they were they were spaced out. And uh, we had a sound system set up in the parking lot. To call out the numbers as the drivers honk for their bingo, it was it was actually um, I wasn't really sure about it when they first said that's what they're going to do, but I was like, well, that's, you know, we'll try it, and it actually worked out really well, and, and the participants had a good time. Our part was, you know, we gave them some of our outreach information, and you know, all all the participants got that whether they won bingo or not. So uh, they all they all got to take home something, and they've done two or three of those. I think they've actually got one scheduled for tomorrow, so they're still um, they're still doing them occasionally. And like I said, the elders are ready to do something because they they still can't get together. Our AOA is still closed and drive through only. And. Uh, I usually host a tribal kids fishing derby with uh, my EPA water grant. Uh, it's an education project every year. Uh, we have a pond where we invite kids from our learning center down and we fish with cane poles and we uh, have fish education activities. And it turns, you know, it's usually a really nice day for us and something we've done for about, you know, seven years or so. And of course, that this year that wasn't going to happen. They, you know, our daycare was closed, our learning centers closed. There was no summer school programs. There was, you know, there just wasn't any gatherings of any kind. So um, I put together an activity booklet. I went online and I found some puzzle maker uh, software sites that you could make your own puzzles with. You know, you put in your own words. And uh, you could make crosswords and word search and two or three different things. And then uh, I added coloring pages, information about fish advisories in our area, information about fish ID, how to tell, you know, a catfish from a bass. And we tried to make it, you know, interesting for a kid and still fun. We also sent them stickers and magic scratch and um, tattoos, temporary tattoos and some Earth Day stickers but and we mailed those out to about 300 local tribal kids and we did get some good feedback from the parents they said they you know their kids are excited to get their own mail they thought that was pretty neat and then they also uh, you know enjoyed having something to do you know besides just just being at home And then the tribe also had a lot of activities that got canceled. One of those was our annual back to school powwow. And it's it's usually every year, first weekend in August. And this year they said, well, we aren't gonna cancel, but we're gonna modify it. And they, they set it up as also a drive-through event. You can see that middle picture there, that's, that's me in the green shirt. And there's, there's just a mile of cars in a row there and the cars kept coming for a little while but it all actually worked out pretty well and so we had our masks on and, and uh, had sanitizer at every table and we had different people on each side of the driveway there with different materials uh, like I said backpack full of school supplies and that's anybody that shows up you know can get one there's it's not limited to tribal kids um so we had we had a pretty good crowd but it went pretty smooth and um, and i think most people were just like i said excited to get the school supplies and then 
uh, we gave them little pumpkin planters, which they, you know, it has a little kit where they could uh, plant their own pumpkin seeds. And I told them maybe by the time school school got started, they have some sprouts. So um, I think it it actually turned out really well. And again, it was just kind of nice to have something where you got to see people, but not necessarily um, have to worry about close contact because we were all outdoors. This is uh, my Lost Creek Water Festival. I've been doing that since 2015. And uh, the one in 2019, we had about 650 or 700 kids from different schools in this area come to this event. So, you know, it's something that's grown a little bit every year. And we're usually excited to host them, at, you know, Usually a, a fifth grade age range, you know, sometimes we have third, fourth and fifth, some, you know, depending on the school and who they want to send. But uh, we usually have a, a really good crowd and a really good day. We have several different presenters from different tribes and agencies. And uh, 2020 was just not going to work. And so I started uh, asking around the other area tribes in Northeast Oklahoma and to see if anybody would be willing to put together a video about water quality education. And I did uh, a couple on my own. And then uh, Why Not Nation and Peoria Nation all each donated one. And then I got together with a couple of the ladies from Why Not Nation and we did a video at the creek. We collected macroinvertebrates and our IT person uh, here at the tribe actually did all the video work for us because I don't know how to do any of that. Uh, but he kind of does that, you know, on an amateur level, uh, on his off time, and then he does do it for the tribe, you know, as videos are needed. We're, we're using more and more videos for the tribe, but it's on our tribal YouTube channel, and I think uh, in, it's still up there. It's about an hour long. So um, there's five videos combined into one. And I, ha I sent that out to the teachers and the schools that I would normally invite to come to our in-person event. So uh, I don't know, that was, it felt a little weird <laughs> not to have contact, you know, with the participants, but um, know that uh, some of the teachers were glad to have something different as far as material for their classroom and they could, you know, they could stop it and start it, maybe watch parts on, you know, one day and part the next to break it up. But um, like I said, we were, we were just looking for a way to, to make something available as an education and outreach project. And, and it actually, um, the video turned out better than I thought. They would, because I was thinking from my own from my own self. I'm not a very technical person, so and I don't really like to have my picture taken. So I really wasn't too sure about a video, but uh, it turned out to be pretty fun, and uh, I think it was um, a pretty good substitute, uh, considering what we had to deal with. And our eighth annual tire event last year, that's something we've done for several years and uh, we usually do it in May every year. And actually we've got one coming up next month for this year, but uh, we, we were held off till September last year and we advertised as an unmanned event thinking, you know, we weren't gonna be, because normally we help people unload their tires and we stack them and um, we were trying to avoid a lot of interaction up close with people, but, but still wanted to be there to manage the traffic flow. And you can see from the top picture that string of cars, they just kept coming all day and all day the next day. And it was pickups full of tires, pickups with trailers full of tires, trailers of all shapes and sizes, homemade ones, fancy ones, all of them full of tires. And I was floored 
um, so we beat our last year's record for our 2019 record for tires. We got 7,735 tires just in two days. And so we had miles of uh, tires after that. And then the state of Oklahoma sent semis down. You can see those two trucks down there at the bottom. That's towards the end of the pickup. I think it took them a five truckloads to haul them all off. And uh, the ODEQ is our partner in that as far as they, they provide the pickup service for the tires. We just have to collect them and try to keep a count. So we thought we were doing good when we hit 3,000 one year and then it just kept getting bigger. And then we advertise on TV every year. We, we get a PSA um, with um, a local TV station. And I think that really helps us out. It, it seems to get bigger. I, I hope we run out of tires at some point. But, um, like I said, we do, we do uh, advertise that event and we get, get really good participation, probably more than my back would like to, like to see. <laughs> Um, and usually we have general counsel and powwow towards the end of the fiscal year. You know, it's usually in September. And we did not, well, they did a general counsel meeting, but it was very um, monitored as far as the number of people, how, how to space people out, social distancing, masking. You know, it was all as, as safe as you could do for you know, an annual meeting, and uh, but we weren't able to do a powwow. We weren't able to have uh, interaction with uh, a lot of our tribal folks that a lot of times they wonder what we do every year. And so we thought, you know, we put this together in a booklet, kind of like the fishing booklet, but this is for, for more for grownups. And, uh, and it does describe what each of us do what what it means when we say water quality, drinking water, you know, why is, why is uh, what we do important and what do we do for the land, what, you know, and I put some different trivia and puzzles and things like that in there too to make it hopefully a little bit more fun. And we sent those out by mail. Uh, instead of passing them out at general council because we weren't really sure how many to expect, um, we went ahead and mailed them out to tribal households in a 50 mile radius. And our household, household hazardous waste collection. Um, Cherokee Nation hosted this event at uh, Miami, Oklahoma. And we, we participated, brought outreach materials and handed those out. It was on another drive through event. They came by and uh, drove through and they were given bags as they drove through. And uh, that was another much needed event in our area. So we were we were glad to be able to participate. And the tribe normally hosts a holiday party for our, our kids every year. And, uh, but uh, we had to do that drive through. It's hard to really hard to do a Christmas party drive through. <laughs> But if we had Santa Claus out there and we had different stations set up that uh, had different materials to give away and we used a little bit of recycling. Um, I was on the planning committee, but I didn't come up with the known idea that uh, a lady from our print shop had seen this where you take uh, old artificial Christmas trees and you could paint them white or you could leave them green and uh, you take old flannel shirts, old pajama pants and uh, make gnome hats, and so we had multiple gnomes along the along the driveway there, and several stations. And then at the at the end, you can see there um, the guy standing by the sign. Thanks for hanging with your gnomies. Uh, that was a biker group, and they actually came to our uh, back to Iowa and the children's Christmas party. And they, they were the traffic directors for us, which helped more than you can realize when you start thinking about several, you know, 100 cars coming through at once and, or even 50 or 60 cars coming through 
uh, it really helped to have some um, some help with the traffic and they were really fun and you know they they danced in the parking lot and they they made it a fun a fun day too so uh, we really appreciated their help so we made it through 2020 and here we are in 2021 we're still moving along water quality is in good shape uh, recycling still curbside and we're still taking care of all of our basic stuff our drinking water wastewater all of our necessities uh, we're starting to work on our uh, we're working really hard with the greenhouses right now and one of my co-workers that's that's one of her her main duties is you know getting plants in the ground ready for for summer and we're going to uh, try to make this a better year for our greenhouses it was kind of hard to do without any manpower last year and we didn't could, couldn't find supplies for anything either so uh, and their property management we're getting some new units they're working on the, the building a new duplex currently and that should be ready pretty soon and our, uh, we got a BIA grant last started last year in late summer for uh, feral hogs their feral hog removals of invasive species and uh, so we have so we added a staff member there and we added a full-time recycling person so we went from four people through most of 2020 to to seven and we also have three interns coming soon we had one uh, one through our uh, epa water quality grant they helped me with sampling and two through a bia grant for a youth initiative so we're looking forward to get help this summer to, to get all these things done and our outreach started looking up a little bit this year uh, we started off with um, the tribe got a tribal food distribution grant and for our part we bought the bags that they put all the food in and also provide a lot of boxes from the recycle center uh, and we've done this they do one day a month and i think it only goes through june or july but it started in december and, and um, the bags and have been a really big help and they're reusable uh, one of them's insulated you know that's what we usually put the meat and things in and for the elders uh, our department delivers those to their to their homes the ones that are on the list so um, 75 homes a, a month get the get the bags and uh, i'm sure they appreciate the groceries more than the bags but at least they do have something that uh, reminds them that we're still here and we're we're still trying to do what we can to help them and we're encouraging them to reuse those bags when they go to the store or uh, when they do grocery shopping on their own or to bring them back so we can fill them back up again the next month and i finally got to do a youth outreach event in this just uh, earlier this month uh, the Seneca Intermediate School invited us to do an all school reads family night. So they had uh, third, fourth, and fifth graders and they had them read My Side of the Mountain. Um, and it, you know, so the whole school was involved. And so they hosted an outdoor event after they got finished with the book. And we had 125 students attend with their families. and. They encouraged masking and things, of course. And then our station was on uh, plants and trees and pollinators and uh, information regarding those things. And we gave each child a, a planter with soil and uh, sunflower seeds. And I actually grew some here in my office just to make sure they work and they're, they're taken off. So um, they're gonna be mammoth sunflowers and uh, so far they're about a foot tall you know the, there's one that's that's really trying to climb out the windows as soon as he can get out so uh, but i have my little tree circles you know we we talk about tree rings and the importance of trees in our in our world and uh, the importance of pollinators in our world 
and that um, and a lot of my side of the mountain book was about you know trees and nature and what what uh, what everything around us does to help us you know they you know plants that provide food and uh, trees that provide shelter and and food and much needed things and the pollinators that make both of those things grow and uh, it was it was a really nice night. It was really good weather, and I just really enjoyed being able to be around people again. It was it was kind of a nice change, even if we were distancing. And also, Earth Day was this month, uh, last week, actually a week ago. Our Eastern Shawnee Learning Center kids, and uh, again the Seneca Intermediate School, the fifth grade. Um, I purchased butterfly kits from Uchi Butterfly Farm. I thought it was nice that our previous presenter mentioned Uchi Butterfly Farm as well for his plants. And uh, you can also get butterfly kits. And it's a really cool educational tool for any age. Uh, but you can see the littler kids, and you know, that they were just kind of mesmerized like what is this thing and then then to see a, a caterpillar come out and then then they've got caterpillars for a few days and the picture is the cup with caterpillars in it i just got that today and uh, so they should have some chrysalis next week and uh, some butterflies shortly after that some painted ladies but i was really thankful uh, uchi butterfly farm could partner with us on that to provide you know, there's nothing like a, a really cool visual ecology lesson. And each kid got their own butterfly and they, they babysit them until they hatch. And then they're going to do big, big butterfly releases at each location. But in the meantime, they're learning a lot. And uh, like I said, it's, it's one of the best ways to learn, I think. And this is just a project that our department did right outside our office and the second picture the one on the right uh, those office windows that's actually my office and so I can watch and see what happens as these uh, native plants start coming up we've got some milkweed out there and some verbena and bee balm and some other things that are going to attract some some bees some butterflies some other pollinators hopefully maybe some birds too I'm sure and uh, but we you know this is a project we actually implemented this probably four or five years ago, but it had gotten kind of dilapidated. So we wanted to revamp it a little bit. And we put in those plants last week and it was, it was a very nice way to spend Earth Day, you know, with your hands in the dirt and wrestling mulch bags. And we do have some events coming up. Like I said, our ninth annual tire collection is next month, May 20th and 21st. Uh, our Tribal Kids Fishing Derby. We're doing a real fishing derby again this year, June 4th. Our Learning Center kids are gonna meet me down at the pond and I'm gonna have some out, outdoor education projects for them. And uh, hopefully that'll be a really good day. Pray for good weather for us. <laughs> and our Lost Creek Water Festival. Um, we usually do that in September. I don't have a date yet, but it, uh, I wanna make sure that the tribe is going to be able to host a powwow first. I don't want to host events at the powwow grounds if if we can't have a powwow. So, um, but I think uh, I've talked to some of the other people that usually present at my events and I've talked to a couple of the schools and they seem to be feeling very positive about uh, things that are happening for 2021, that things are getting better and we're, we're moving uh, more back to being able to get together is, you know, and see people for a change. Uh, the tribe is also doing some uh, things to uh, as far as the, we aren't doing culture camp this year, but we are doing a summer reading program through our library. They got a grant uh, to provide uh, different education projects through the summer. So I think five different weeks of the, the summer the, on a Wednesday, we'll be doing an environmental lesson of some sort. And I know two or three of them are gonna be water. And then 
um, we've got one on recycling and, a, and I think at least one on plants. So uh, I think it'll be a fun summer for us. We still don't have as many of the community events as we usually do. And, uh, but we're happy to, to see some of our things coming back. I know I really missed outreach as part of my job. I, as much as I love just the water quality part, that the outreach is kind of a bonus for me because I just uh, I enjoy that so much. So we're looking forward to better days ahead. And I think that that wraps it up for me. I don't know if there's any questions for me. Thank you, Debbie. Um, once you stop sharing your screen, you should be able to see your chat box. Um, okay. I don't questions just yet, but I did have a request for your PowerPoint. So okay. if you find sending it to me, I will share it with others. If you take your cursor and and move it to the there, it it showed top, up. Yeah, okay. It's okay. kind of hard to find. <laughs> All right. The pollinator habitat originally that was um, part of a gap project. We had a, we actually had um, a larger one too that we did down along our trails. We have about six miles of trails that the tribe has put in. And uh, we get a lot of people coming through there and we put a pollinator habitat down there along the trails and then kind of a, some of the leftover plants and the, um, the milkweed, particularly, we wanted to install up here by our office too because we get a lot of traffic, just people walking, walking by, driving through. Thank you, Debbie. Um, do you have any other questions in your chat box? That's the only one I saw is about funding for the for the pollinator habitat. Most, like I said, most of my funding, pretty much all of my funding, water quality and non-point source is all EPA. Uh, the tribe does fund all the other projects that our department does, like the drinking water management, wastewater, property management, stress management, things like that. And then so we've got a couple of BIA grants mixed in there now. And, But our recycling program has, uh, you know, really been beneficial for us and for the community, and uh, that's all funded by our GAP program. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any other um, messages, questions just yet in the chat box, so. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, thank you, Debbie. All right, thank you. Okay, let me. Our next presenter is Victoria with the Pueblo of Santa Ana, and I will give you presenter Victoria so you can share your screen. We can see. Okay, awesome. Um, so, did I skip it? Okay, well, <laughs> I can't get back to my um, intro slide, but hi everybody. My name is Victoria Tencio and I work for the Pueblo of Santa Ana um, as the environmental educator and community outreach coordinator. So just to um, give you a little input of where Santa Ana is located, um, we're located in Sandoval County here in New Mexico, approximately 20 miles north of Albuquerque. And the tribe has over 144,000 acres. Um, the Pueblo of Damaya is um, 79 and then Kiwi, Nipu is 65, um, which was um, acquired in 2015. So, um, you know, if you've been in New Mexico and in Albuquerque area, um, 
Bernalillo, the city of Bernalillo actually kind of runs through these two um, corridors of Santa Ana. And so um, the Pueblo of Santa Ana itself is pretty small population. Um, and so um, Okay, so um, the Pueblo of Santa Ana, then the Department of Natural Resources, uh, we have six divisions. Um, and so that's the Conservation Law Enforcement Division, Environmental Division, that's where I'm in, um, RGIS, Range and Wildlife, Restoration, and then our Water Resources. And so, as the environmental education and community outreach coordinator, a lot of what I do is helping the Department of Natural Resources get information um, out to the community and also do a lot of collaboration within our tribe, but also um, outside of the tribe. So, what I do as a coordinator is I make all of our community meetings. Um, help create outreach materials and provide education and curriculum to our youth programming, um, which is say H2O and also summer programming for um, some of our younger students. Um, a lot of collaboration that we do within the tribe, uh, we do have a green team, an animal team, and a good health and wellness team. And so Based on each of these teams, a lot of us come together, for example, for green team. Um, I work a lot with the wellness, um, just providing good information on how we can come together to restore and help um, promote stewardship throughout the community. Um, and then you'll see within this presentation, a lot of those examples being presented. And in our animal team, I work a lot with our CHR um, as well as um, PD, our police department, to um, you know just ensure safety of any animal bites, um, providing spays and neuters resources for our community, and also doing rabies shots. And with our nonprofit, are working with nonprofits, federal agencies, and also providing um, people who actually reach out. Um, to the department, which is really nice. Um, we've had a few grad students ask for assistance and they would come to me and then I would reach out to uh, my colleagues and see um, who would be the best fit for them. Um, but a lot of what I do, the underlying basis of my role here at Santa Ana is to develop and implement natural resource stewardship to community members by educating the importance of natural resources and the natural environment. Um, so before COVID, this is actually a really nice picture. I miss those meetings and just being with many people um, within the Pueblo. And so this is a great example of our green team coming together. This was, um, right before all of our tribal programs shut down. And we were actually um, planning our Earth Day event. And so before COVID, a lot of events that we were planning um, consist of hosting workshops, um, doing our Earth Day event, as I mentioned in the picture, lots of conferences, trainings, and traveling planning our say H2O summer program, which usually consists of camping um, for about two, three days, um, our annual environmental fair, and a spay and neuter clinic. During this time before COVID, right in the early beginnings of March of 2020, we were planning lots of things um, to provide to our community members, however, um, our, all of our tribal programs shut down on in March. And so all of these events that I've listed were either postponed or canceled. Um, and we're still kind of in that realm now here. Um, 
not just our Pueblo, but a lot of other tribal communities in New Mexico, we've all remained um, shut down. So um, it's been really interesting to see as um, an outreach coordinator, how we can provide information to our community as, as we're going virtual. And so I'm sure a lot of you have been doing the virtual world as um, many, you know, as I have. And so a lot of the outreach that I have been doing is primarily on Facebook or through our email. Um, we do have a community email. And so just sending out information, outreach um, packets or flyers, but also hosting um, webinars um, through Zoom, Teams, WebEx meetings, um, Google Meets. Um, some of our non-virtual um, outreach that we've done this past year is um, our newsletters, which are um, basically based on the season. So we have one every season, um, posting things on the marquees, um, actually um, calling community members, seeing if they need any assistance, um, especially when it comes to um, pet services. Um, but a lot of this adapting to COVID within our tribal community has, you know, been really impactful. And I wanna thank um, our leadership and other tribal departments to kind of come together and um, promote this outreach and giving our community members um, things that they can do while they're at home since we're all on lockdown. So once the tribe shut down in March, um, a lot of what we did was postponed. However, um, we did provide a lot, a lot of resources virtually and or through um, drive through events. So here are pictures and examples. We did have a generous donation from um, Healing Paws across borders. Um, they gave us about 200 pounds in dog food and cat food. Um, so we did a little distribution to community members. We also had a um, resilience garden drive through. We received we received 20 to 30 boxes of, of garden seeds and gave them out to the community. And you can see um, some of the examples of garden beds being seeded. We also do a lot of environmental outreach. Um, a lot of what we did during COVID was um, just raising awareness of improving indoor air quality since we're all home and on lockdown and also showing the community um, what's going on, um, wildlife with wildlife, um, what's occurring within the Pueblo, um, educating our community about um, people who are actually still out in the field, even though they don't see us in the office. We are still working. Okay, and in the summer, things started to um, kind of ramp up a little bit, which was really nice. We were able to provide some air quality program um, information and start off a little raffle just to help get the community involved, as well as providing um, clean green kits, uh, working with some nonprofit organizations to kind of help uh, promote um, cleaning and sterilizing your homes, um, developing new newsletters, as well as reaching out with other nonprofit organizations, presenting on our wildlife corridors, habitat enhancement, and also providing monthly farmers um, outlook webinars for, for weather, um, which was really nice. We had a really great response. And so during the summer months, 
uh, we would host. As for summer programming, I did mention at the beginning that we have our sah 2 program as well as um, just summer activities that we provide for our youth. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, we had to cancel all of our in-person, but we, but we adapted and created a series of videos um, for our youth to kind of follow along with us. And so, how this worked is we came together um, um, making different curriculum and activities to provide for our youth and putting together small packets um, that they would come and pick up. And then, the, and then within the next week, we'd be going live with our videos on how to, um, how to do those activities and demonstrate for them. During the fall of 2020, we had a rabies drive through clinic and spay and neuter clinic. Um, it was a 2 day event in which um, we worked with our tribal uh, leadership to. Promote community members to um, come and get their pets uh, serviced. We did have a lot of. Issues. Um, with a lot of our pets, especially um, in population. So this was a really great service um, to provide for our community members. And in the fall as well, we developed a Thamaya pumpkin patch, which was really nice. Uh, with COVID, we did have to work with our emergency command center to host this event. Um, and what we did was we split the pumpkin patch into two, two fields. That way families were able to come out and enjoy themselves with their own family, but also um, promoting that social distancing and requiring that it was a mask event. Also in the fall, we began doing fall gardening. Uh, we saw that in the spring, a lot of community members were very interested in growing their plants at home, um, as well as just getting outdoors for mental and physical health. So um, DNR along, along with the nursery came together to build um, these garden boxes to promote um, gardening. And the four garden boxes that you see um, are actually going to different tribal programs within the Pueblo to promote um, healthy eating. And in the winter, as things kind of calm down, um, we did um, continue to promote with our newsletters updating community members about the work that is being done on the Pueblo, um, as well as reaching out on social media. We also continued hosting webinars for farmers and ranchers, um, kind of talking about uh, the drought in New Mexico and um, providing resources that farmers and ranchers could look at. And then also just planning for our new year. And with that, um, in 2020, we remained optimistic of um, some of the outreach that we do here at the Pueblo, um, you know, just as an environmental educator. It has been very difficult to um, get our kids outdoors and also to have that participation. Um, so with our new virtual world, a lot of what we're doing now is continuing to adapt, but also being optimistic of what we can provide for community members in the future. 
So right now in spring of 2021, we, um, the Pueblo of Santa Ana is working with uh, the wellness, the wellness program, the nursery and the Department of Natural Resources to get herb kits together uh, for community members so that we can continue promoting that growing from home and having a healthy lifestyle. We also just had um, an Earth Week, which was really nice. A lot of tribal programs came together to promote different activities that the community members could um, participate in, as well as receive um, native plants, herb gardens, um, a tote bag, and t-shirts. It was really nice to get youth involved. You can see in some of the pictures um, this year, about 11 youth went out and collected trash in their yards or um, along the roads, which was great to see them getting out. Um, and so some current projects that I'm working on right now. Um, so today, actually this afternoon, We'll be giving out um, native plant kits as well as our newsletter for the spring. We are also working on developing a pollinator garden and building more garden boxes that we can um, either provide to the community and also create some education, develop some videos, and how to build green box garden boxes. We are also planning um, to do a virtual summer program in July. Um, like I mentioned previously, it's usually a two or three day um, camping trip. However, we are still on lockdown. So we will be providing packages for our youth and um, creating an atmosphere online where we can um, guide them through some environmental education. And also continue to work on virtual workshops on rangeland management and soil health. And that's pretty much um, how much outreach we have done within a whole year. It has taken a lot, not just um, myself pulling this all together, but a lot of people coming together. So I just want to give some recognition to all of our nonprofits, our tribal programs, our federal agencies um, who have came together to make all of this happen for the Pueblo of Santa Ana. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box just yet. Um, if you want to go ahead and check your chat box and see if there's any comments or questions for you. I do not see any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box um, or in my email, but um, if you think of a question afterwards, please just send me or Victoria an email. And um, with that, I'd like to thank Victoria, Debbie, and Kirsten for their presentations this afternoon. We appreciate it. And we'll end this session, um, but our next session will start at 3 o'clock and it's the grants management. So be sure and join us then. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.